Today is the day in the church year which we have set aside to celebrate life. Now in truth, every day should be a day that we celebrate the gift that God has given us of life, the ability to breathe, the opportunity to celebrate and share his love with one another. Oftentimes, we ce- when we celebrate sanctity of life, we, we develop a bit of tunnel vision, and we lose focus that every day is a celebration, and we become focused on issues such as abortion, which it, admittedly, it is something that is uh, something we should talk about in church, but it's not the only issue about life that we should discuss. And while it is a beautiful thing, that life of children, God has given each person a reason to celebrate. God has given each of us the opportunity to be his children, to value the gifts he has given to us. And life is not valuable because we value it, but it is valuable because God values it. And probably that could summarize the entire sermon. We could stop right there just about, because God values life, then it should be valuable to us. Perhaps you remember just last week, and when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we read those words, Do you not know? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own, but you were bought with a price. We know that God values us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. That he values us so much that he was willing to trade his life for our lives. Sadly, sometimes people lose sight of their value. Sometimes people lose sight of being a child of God as they grow older. They're not able to bend down to tie their shoe like they once were. They don't get up from the pew as fast as they once did. They can't lift a nail and hammer over their head as high as they once could. And perhaps some of you have felt this way. That as you have grown older, that that you've wrestled with what it means to find purpose, to, to be valuable to God. Perhaps some of you have asked the question at one time or another, Lord, what is your purpose for me? Why am I still here? Wouldn't it be easier if you just called me home to my heavenly rest? Now the psalmist, as you know, has often wrestled with the same issues we have. And I love the way he addresses it because he has a way of seeing through some of the dark clouds to the silver lining of God's gift. In Psalm chapter 71, and I'm just going to share a snippet with you this morning. I encourage you to read all of Psalm 71, but just this short snippet. You see that the psalmist trusts in God, even in old age, that he never loses that trust. But as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation all the day long, though I know not its measure. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O Lord God. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. Since my youth, O O God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I'm old and I'm gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Our purpose does not end when our hair changes color, When we're not able to do what we once could do. Our purpose continues on. As the psalmist said, we always have hope. We always have confidence because we have the Lord. We have faith. We have a hope that cannot be replaced by what this world has to offer. But what about if the generation after us doesn't listen? What about if the generation after us says they know it all already? What about if the generation after us, well, what if they'd rather go to a close friend than seek the advice of parents and grandparents? What about then? Has our good advice as parents and grandparents gone the way of, well, books, replaced by technology, devices that we can read books, and if we can't get it in a point and click, it's not worth our time? Advertisers have realized that those long lectures, those Interesting stories are too long and replaced much of our lives with slogans about sound bites, slogans of sound bites. So are our, is our wisdom still worth it? Do we still have that gift to pass on to the next generation? Do we still have those words of advice, those words of hope? 
to speak to a generation that loses interest within six seconds. Sometimes it's hard to see our purpose. See our usefulness in a generation where technology has made everything so easy. Now, technology is not the problem here, but it is what is promoted through technology. Instead of seeing every person as worthwhile, every person as valuable, we see one person as worth it, one person as valuable, and that's me. If I'm not ahead, then who, ca- then who cares until I get ahead? In fact, We've even replaced some of the words of Scripture with popular quotes, such as, God helps those who help themselves. Believe it or not, that is not in Scripture. Perhaps maybe Third Hezekiah, which also is not in Scripture. But many times we remember these old phrases that come from this interest in self, this interest in what I can do, instead of hearing the words of Christ Jesus in Matthew 11 which invites us to expose our weakness and cast our burdens onto him. No, our God, he did not create us to be autonomous, to be individuals who only see value in ourselves. But he created us to seek the support and strength of others, to seek the support and strength of those around us, those older, those younger. The society sends a message that that is weakness, isn't it? If we seek the help of someone else, then we're, maybe not as strong as we thought we were. Perhaps if we seek the help and support of someone else, it's a sign of need. Hmm. In fact, we go so far as to say those people who have need, those people who have weaknesses, as sometimes people who have disabilities. Disabilities. What an interesting terminology It's replaced older terms, and we've come a long way in the way we look at people with disabilities, but we still have special terms for the disabled. At one time, we used words such as retarded or idiot, and those were proper medical terms, but those words became abused. Our society used those to mock and make fun of others, and so we've become more politically correct, and we use words such as handicapped or disabled. But even in those words themselves, don't they suggest that that person is less in some way? The word handicap comes from a, actually a phrase in the, from the 1600s, hand in cap. The advantage that was given to a, a racehorse that, that was chosen from the hand in cap. The advantage given because that horse may not do as well. Also, most of the definitions for handicap in some way involve disadvantaged or disabled. That word disabled, crippled, incapacitated here. Our words may have changed, our vocabulary may have shifted. We may celebrate the fact that we can, we have an Americans with Disabilities Act, we have all these things now, but really these are superficial changes. Really these do not get at the heart of the issue, which is our attitude. It is our attitude of the way that we see other people. The way that we look at other people, it gets at the very fact that if someone cannot do what we can do or we believe they should do, that they are some way less. That maybe they are not as valuable. Our world talks about it and giving, giving out bumper stickers and things like that. But those vocabulary changes don't help when we see that the problem is how we value others. The truth is, We are all disabled in some way or another. Some of us can sing. Some of us can do math. Some of us can work well with our hands, shaping metal and wood. Some of us can work the ground. Some of us are good at basketball. Some of us are good at baseball. Some of us are good at talking or caring for others. But none of us are good at everything. Not one of us is good at everything. And so we need one another. We need each other's gifts and abilities. And while we at times will say that a person with a disability is less valuable, they are still a child of God. They are a person who he has given worth to. They are a person who God can use in his particular way, in his particular time. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, 
Now the body, referring to the church, is not made up of one part, but of many. In fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. See, well, we are all different. Well, we are all unique. Well, we don't all have the same exact gifts. They are each useful and part of God's body, part of his church. And so when we look at someone and we say they are disabled, are we looking at them as God sees them? When we look at somebody and we say that they do not have the abilities we have, perhaps it is not that they are disabled, but that God has given them a different ability. What is normal after all? Because isn't that what we measure it by? Tests and empirical data that we line people up against. But that is not how God values. God's value comes in the very fact that each life was worth it to him. That each soul, whether they were cognitively disabled and able to do the the things we can do, or is the smartest person in the world, that each soul is worth it to him. A few days ago, actually almost probably a month ago now, Carla had me watch a YouTube video, and it was about a mom of a little girl by the name of Mason. And this, little, this mom and this little girl were on YouTube, and they were building awareness for children with Down syndrome. Now this mother, as she showed the cards for her two-year-old daughter, Mason, as she li- gave the message, not once did she say that Down syndrome was a problem. Not once did she say that Down syndrome was a disability, but instead she looked at it as a gift. And she admitted it was hard. It was a struggle. The doctors had encouraged her to abort Mason well before she was even born. But this mother went ahead and she gave birth to a beautiful little girl who does struggle with some of the things that we find simple. But she is still a child of God. This mother saw her as a unique and a wonderful addition to God's family. And how amazing it is when we look around and we say, yeah, some of us, we have what the world would call disabilities. I myself, I wear contacts. Some of you, I've noticed, wear hearing aids. Only one or two, right? I've noticed a few of you have a cane when you walk in or a walker when you come in. Does that mean you've lost your value? That you're any less valuable? No. Contrary to what the world would say, no. Each person is valuable because they are valuable to God. There is, in fact, only one disability that we share. There is, in fact, one disability that goes deeper than our flesh and our bone. There is one disability that goes down to our very core, and that is the disability of sin. Because sin cripples us from going to our Father. Sin cripples us from being able to walk before our Lord and kneel in His presence. Sin cripples us and leaves us as poor beggars. But our merciful Lord, He sent one who had no disability, no no sin. That is Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Our Savior who came, who gave His life for our life. Our Savior who came and took away that crippling disability of sin and invited us to come unto Him and receive the forgiveness that God offers, our Heavenly Father offers. To come to Him in all the trials and tribulations we have in this life and know that we are people chosen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people who belong to God. See, Christ's healing, it was not skin deep. It was not nearly that superficial. Christ's healing, it went down beneath, down to the core of our spirit and our soul and brought the healing of life. The healing that invites us to come and be children of God. And our Lord, He encourages us. He encourages us to choose life as He has chosen life. Our Lord encourages us to see worth as He sees worth. 
to not undervalue those who are different than us, to not undervalue those who we label with disabilities or handicaps, but to know that they are children just as we are children. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, our Lord says to us, Now choose life, so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to His voice, and hold fast to Him, for the Lord is your life. True life, true living, and true worth come from being the children of God. Knowing the Lord is our Savior. Knowing the promise, He invites us to live in His promised land. He invites us to live not in a world full of people who have been broken by sin and death, but invites us to come and live in a world of His life. And so yes, there will be times. Times when we as people of God grow weary. Where we will grow achy. Where we won't be able to hear as well, we won't be able to see as well. We may not even be able to to express the pains and problems we feel. But that does not in any way make us any less worthless or wor- worthwhile. It does not in any way make us worthless because we are valuable to our Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that because of your death on the cross, You have given each of us value. We thank you that you have chosen us to give us life eternal. And we pray that each day we would see this as a gift from you. That we would see each and every person as a wonderful gift that you have placed on this earth. Lord, help us to look past those physical disabilities, those mental disabilities, those things that we perceive as less and know that you can use them even more. Lord, help us to see that each of us has purpose, that each of us is valuable. And may our hope always be sure, knowing that one day, as you called your children of old into the promised land, you call us to the promised land of life eternal, that you call us from this world to the next, where we will celebrate in your name. And therefore it is in your name, O Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.